Welcome to Bookmobile Zooming Through Your Community on Wheels. Um, there are links in the chat box to all these great uh, handouts and frequently asked question lists, as well as a survey at the end. Um, if you can take, it takes like one minute um, to fill out our quick survey on how this goes today. So I'm Kathy Lancaster. I'm Youth Services Coordinator at the Library of Michigan. And my partner in crime here is... Oh, thank you. Thank you for that, that segue. Um, I'm Joe Hamlin. I'm the State Library Data Coordinator. Um, and we thought this was a great idea to bring um, basically the experts to, to you so we can learn together more about bookmobiles, the ins and outs, unexpected things, um, and, and you know just benefit from these folks' experience. So joining us today, we have Bay County Library System Director Tish Burn, Trish Burns and Managing Librarian Kirsten Wellnitz, Boyne District Libraries Director Monica Peck, Capital Area District Libraries Director Scott Dimstra, Detroit Public Libraries Coordinator for Major Library Activity Regina Smith, East Lansing Public Libraries Director Kristen Shelley, <clears throat> Kent District Libraries Bookmobile Scheduler and Operator Joanne Houston Swanson, Lenaway District Libraries Director Trevor Van Volkenberg, Menominee County Libraries Outreach Librarian Ann Best, Monroe County Library Systems Head of Community Outreach Barbara Kruger, Rochester Hill Public Libraries Head of Outreach Services Mary Davis, and Ypsilanti Libraries Head of Outreach Services Mary Gaboden. Oh, and we jumped right into my slide too. Great. So <laughs> since 1995, bookmobiles have had um, somewhat of a decline nationally. In 95, there were more than a thousand bookmobiles operating in the United States. And um, as of 2018, which is the most currently available national data from the IMLS, there are about 630 operating across the country right now. So it's a 37% decline. But now with the pandemic and we're trying to find new ways to provide services and to connect those folks um, digitally and with library materials in new ways. Uh, it, it feels like there's a resurgence. There's a lot of literature out there talking about bringing bookmobiles back, <clears throat> which is why we're, we're very grateful to hear from our panelists today on how they provide this service and what they offer their communities. Thanks, Joe, for that look. Um at bookmobiles and where they are today. Uh, just a quick note that the Association of Bookmobile and Outreach Services um, does exist under the umbrella of American Library Association. Um, if you are curious about them, we've got their website on the slides and you're able to access that. Um, and the uh, Upcoming events for 2021 are pretty fun. You can see here a list of them. Um, we just celebrated Virtual Bookmobile Parade. I saw quite a few of our bookmobiles on their feed that day, um, but they were full. Like they had bookmobiles going up about every eight minutes from across the world. So if you go back and look at ABOS um, at their Facebook page, that was quite a lot of fun to watch all those bookmobiles and the services that they provide around the world um, stream in. So take a look at that, um, check out their resources and be sure to celebrate. You don't have to be a member to celebrate um, Little Free Library Week or um, the Book Bike Week. So check them out. And we're going to dive in. We're going to start today with a brief look at all the bookmobiles around Michigan. and. Um, then we'll do some highlights of our frequently asked questions, and then we'll follow it up with some live Q&A in our chat box. And I am monitoring the chat, so if you do have questions as um, the panelists show off uh, what they're doing, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll, we'll round them up at the end. Great. So we're going to start off with Bay County Library System. Hi, I'm Kirsten Wellness, the Managing Librarian at the Alice and Jack Burt Library, and Trish Burns is on here with me too. She is the Director of the Bay County Library System. Um, our system has been lucky enough to have a bookmobile on the road since 1975. We have had five in total, and the current one we received in 2014. 
We have one full-time senior library assistant, Stacy. Uh, she was on vacation this week or else she would be on here with us. She is a wealth of knowledge. She has been on the bookmobile for 24 years. She started as a shelving page in high school, was a sub part-time, and now she is the full-time library assistant on there. We also have two part-time staff members and we do have an open vacancy. So if you know anyone who wants to work part-time on the bookmobile, we do have a spot open. Our bookmobile is a small scale mobile branch. We offer services such as a Wi-Fi hotspot. We have two Chrome books for people to use while the bookmobile is at their stop. We have printing available, a variety of lending materials for all ages. People can pick up their holds. We also have grab and go crafts for kids. The favorite feature, and this came from Stacy, since she has the most experience with the different bookmobiles, was the hydraulic lift on the back for patrons with wheelchairs and walkers. The previous one was handicap accessible, but it was difficult to maneuver the ramp unfolded right in the doorway that led directly to the desk and making the turn to get into the bookmobile was almost impossible. Uh, and if there was a steep curb, it wasn't um, as easy to park next to. So. So that was her favorite feature. Thank you. Um, Go ahead, Trish. Yeah, additionally, I just want, thanks. Um, additionally, I just wanted to mention one of the unintended bonuses of having a bookmobile drive through the county every, you know, every other day ish is the publicity. You can see the size of the bookmobile and it's a bus that drives around the county every day with our logo on it. And so the county patrons know that we are on the road working for them every day. And if they don't have the library in mind, that bus drives past them and it puts that in the mind of our patrons. So it's a, a really good publicity thing as well, which we really hadn't thought about until we started hearing um, patrons say, oh yeah, I saw the bookmobile. Yeah, I saw the bookmobile. So that's kind of a, an, an additional little thing that we, we really didn't expect. I love it. The roaming panel. Oh. Billboard. Um, Monica from Boyne District. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to listen to um, us talk about or excuse me, brag about our bookmobiles. <laughs> um, so our bookmobile is fairly new. We first it first hit the road in 2018. Um, well, I should say I'm Monica Peck. I'm the director here at the library. Um, so we have one full time staff member for our bookmobile. Um, we, we offer several different services, which I'll cover uh, a little bit more during the frequently asked questions portion. Um, but as you can see, our bookmobile is pretty bright and colorful. And actually we um, had a contest to have our community uh, design the look of the bookmobile. And this is what um, the winner came up with, which we think is just awesome. So our favorite feature is uh, the excitement on kids' faces when we pull up to the school, which I'll explain a little bit more about later. Thank you, Monica. And next we have Scott. Thank you, uh, Kathy. I'm Scott Dimesher. I'm the executive director of the Capital Area District Libraries here in Ingham County. And uh, we've had our uh, bookmobile, which we call the mobile library, because uh, we when we added it um, to our system in, in 2016, we we envisioned it being um, more than than just a a, um, a a library, and and I'll explain a little bit later on how we're kind of reverting back from that. But we had a a bookmobile um, throughout our entire history, and the circulation actually went down a little bit. But in 2016, we reinvested in it and. Um, purchased this vehicle from uh, Matthews Vehicles in North Carolina. It was around $170,000. Uh, we wanted it to be basically be a functioning branch. And so it has Wi-Fi, it has a browsing collection of about 5,000 items, it has a small seating area inside, it has a full-time librarian and two part-time library assistants. Uh, it has um, also a public computer, it had a uh, visual display um, with a television in there that staff could use. Uh, and it has been fantastic. So we, um, we circulate um, a little over 5,000 uh, items a month out of it. So we have 13 branches in our entire system. It's about middle range um, for where it falls within circulation. So it, it, it out circulates um, some of our smaller libraries. So it truly is uh, its own branch. But within that, it comes with its own issues, which I'm going to talk about 
uh, when I talk about funding and, and the cost of, of upkeep for a mobile library. And it's actually, uh, we're at the, the point where we have to decide what we want to do uh, for the future of it. But that's kind of a, uh, a cliffhanger for what I'll talk about in a, in a little bit um, when I talk about financing mobile libraries. But similar to Trish, um, it's pretty much a billboard uh, out there as well, too. And for this, uh, we have, um, like I said, about 20 stops. Um, they're all different areas. So it could be a senior center, it could be apartment complex, it could be kind of a communal area. And, um, and my favorite part is, is definitely the, the outside of it. So uh, the, the exterior is painted by um, children's illustrator, Alyssa Chavari. And um, you cannot miss this thing when it's coming down the road. And, and, um, and it truly is a billboard, um, but it also, uh, and, uh, and each piece of it um, talks about the different services that you can get at the library as well too. But um, we're kind of at a, a, a point where we have to decide what we wanna do in the future um, with this vehicle. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later on in the presentation. Great, thanks Scott. And I do, I, I have the honor of living in Lansing and I get to see that drive around sometimes and it just gives you a big smile. All right, we're stopping in Detroit next, Regina. How you doing, hi, huh? how's everybody? Good, um, how are you? Share some uh, pictures, who was it? With, I think is Beth of our mobile. We've been on the road since uh, 1940. So if, uh, if she uh, wants to share some of the pictures of uh, our first, some of our first mobile, or they were bookmobile, now we're the mobile library. Um, like Lansing, um, we wanted to expand past just books. Uh, so our mobile library, uh, our current one, has Wi-Fi is the hotspot. It has uh, uh, four standing computers, uh, two uh, areas to sit down and um, work on computers. It has uh, a screen on the outside for showing movies, uh, a screen on the inside for movies as well. Uh, we have, um, video game, gaming equipment in there. We have a uh, printing and um, you can print and um, copy. Um, so uh, because of uh, COVID, we have limited areas that we go to now where we are going to the closed locations of the Detroit Public Library, the closed branches uh, to service those communities that aren't able to be able to go to the library since they're closed for COVID. Um, uh, and this, in the summer, because of COVID last year, we went out to locations that serve food to people in the community. Um, and um, we didn't check out anything. We just wanted to let people know that we care and we're around. Um, so we got books from Aquinas, uh, Aquinas One Club and we gave away books and um, giveaways, uh, trinkets uh, and um, show movies or play music um, and had a lot of fun. Uh, last year, and so this this summer, we'll be um, doing that as well, uh, um, starting in mid June. But right now, we we're continuing to go to about eight close uh, uh, eight of the Detroit Public Library closed branches, and we offer um, we we no one is allowed to get on, but we we're still giving away the free books. But you can reserve and hold your um, books that you're interested in. Uh, if you have a book request, we will look on the mobile to see if we have it, or we'll re reserve it for you. Check it out. We do library cards. Uh, we do uh, take and um, make crafts and. Um, a, we uh, do, we've done a couple of story times. So that's that's the, about the gist of it. And my favorite part is uh, hearing the stories about, I remember the bookmobile when I was a kid and all, all the wonderful stories that people have to tell you. And I have to say that had 
have a few myself. I mean, the library bookmobile really made a difference in my life when I was growing up. So I'm so happy to be able to uh, bring this kind of service to the community. Thank you, Regina. I'm so glad you guys are able to serve some of the closed branches this way too. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah um, thank you. Yeah, so up next we have kind of a new kid on the block here with Kristen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna say, I think we're the youngest um, as far as our uh, mobile library and we call it the library on the go. It um, was kind of five years in the making, uh, but we got it in October of 2020, smack dab in the middle of the pandemic. So all of our plans to be out in the community and at festivals and farmers markets and at the schools uh, kind of um, ended there. But we um, very quickly pivoted and um, we took it out to our senior community centers and our retirement centers. And we have our adult services librarian actually loves to take it out and um, I think the residents at, like to see the, the bright color. So um, we currently use our programming staff or will use our programming staff um, when we take it out more places um, to um, staff it. Um, it. We will have holds on it. It has Wi-Fi. Um, we will check out materials. It has laptop stations. It has space for 3D printers. We're planning on doing story times and different kinds of programming. We thought during the um, pandemic, since we'll still have to be socially distanced, that perhaps we can have an outdoor book discussion and music programs, and of course the take and grab craft programs. Um, one of the greatest features is the Tommy Gate, like somebody else mentioned. We don't have people necessarily coming on to our library on the go, but it allows us to lower the um, carts that are loaded up very easily. And um, so that's very helpful and, and just roll them off. And then the awning is great fun um, because you can have that out and then have tables set out underneath it and do programming and uh, various things from there. But um, truly we are newbies on the block and um, looking forward to, um, I'm not an expert by any, um, stretch of the imagination, but looking to hear what other people are doing. I will say having it parked in our parking lot has been awesome for publicity. People drive by, they see it, they, you know, send things in through um, email and Facebook. Uh, it's just kind of very bright and very fun. And um, so we're really, really looking forward to having it out into the parks and into various places this summer. Well, welcome to the road. <laughs> Up next, we have uh, Joanna. Oops, Unmute I myself. There yep. you go. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> um, we've been on the road uh, for about two and a half years. It was um, probably a two to three year project ahead of that, getting it um, from dream to plan to implementation. And uh, it's been a terrific um, experience. And we have one full-time staff member, three part-time, um, plus our supervisor and puppets, because we have Kem Kevin Camrad um, as part of our team. And uh, currently, you know, pre-pandemic and through the pandemic and post-pandemic, our services will look a little bit different as we shift to meet the changing needs of our communities, but always we have Wi-Fi access wherever we're parked, um, holds pickup and uh, check out for materials. They can search the catalog. Um, we create library cards. Um, we also have a document scanner that will translate into different languages for people. And it's, it's fairly close. Um, for most people, close enough for people to be able to um, fill out documents that they need for, um, you know, medical paperwork and things like that. That's been one of the most recent uh, features that we've added. And uh, when I talk to my coworkers, the main thing we love about our bookmobile is just the flexibility of the space itself. Um, the rolling carts that can plug right into the wall and we can change out the shelves and um, it's it we just really appreciate a lot of those uh, features and uh, again one of um, 
one of the main sources of uh, joy that we have is just being able to be out with our patrons and meet them where they are and have them tell stories of when they remember the bookmobile and uh, and that we're um, starting those memories for a whole new generation. And uh, people are excited to see the bookmobile. Right now, we can't have anybody come on board with us. It's space, um, there's not enough space inside capacity for uh, to allow for the social distancing requirements, but we're looking forward to the day when we can do that. So sooner, hopefully, rather than later, but we'll see. We're almost ready for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't let the puppets drive the bus. Oh, and uh, we have a pigeon from the Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus who sits in the window. And <laughs> so the kids usually see that. And they're like, there's the pigeon. So it's fun. <laughs> yep. Love it. All right. So Trevor, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we've had a bookmobile going at the Lenawee District Library. We used to be a Lenawee County Library, but um, had a bookmobile in operation since 1949. Um, I think we've gone through six uh, vehicles during that time span. We have two part-time librarians that staff it and normal procedure for us pre-COVID, um, there's room for an entire classroom or daycare, um, somewhere like that, they can all get on. Uh, we do kind of like a mobile story time and then they can pick out books uh, and go on from there. With uh, you know limitations for COVID stuff, people aren't getting on it right now. So we really just have gotten it going again uh, in the past couple of weeks after basically being off the road for about a year. Um, so we're trying outdoor story times now. Uh, you know, classes can gather up on the grass, we read them a story, and then uh, teachers can pick out books for the classroom. Uh, we do have an internet hotspot. We do have holds pick up. People can request things. Uh, the majority of our stops are daycare centers and schools. We also do retirement homes, and we have a few uh, just um, residential stops where you know, we stop in a neighborhood and hang out there for a while. Uh, I have a browsing collection of about 2,500. Um, it's just great to be able to, you know, be mobile through the community, serve patrons that might not have easy access to the library. And a couple people have already mentioned, you know, the memories that the bookmobile makes. We just appointed a new library board member uh, a few months ago, and his earliest memory of the library was. Um, the bookmobile coming to his school and him getting to get on and pick out books in the 1950s. So that's, it made enough impact that, you know, he's still got memories of that from that long ago. Um, one more fun fact, <clears throat> like I said, I think we've been through six bookmobiles since 1949. Our current library building has a garage attached to the library, which I think is um, fairly unique. And we pull the bookmobile into it uh, but it was designed for a smaller vehicle than the one you can see pictured there. So to get in the garage, we have to fold the side mirrors in and pull all the way in until uh, the front bumper is touching the, the inside brick wall of the garage. So getting the bookmobile in and out of our garage is one of the uh, most challenging parts of driving it. I guess that's the sign of how things have changed since 1949. <laughs> <laughs> yep, everything's bigger now. Yep. Everything's bigger. Thank you, Trevor. Yep. All right, next we have Ann. Hi, I'm Ann Best. Um, I am the Outreach Coordinator at the Menominee County Library. We are in Stevenson, Michigan. We are a very rural county. The entire county is rural. Um, we are in the south central part of the Upper Peninsula, so that's also unique. We're the only bookmobile in the Upper Peninsula, I believe. Uh, we're about an hour and a half north of the city of Green Bay. Um, we started our outreach uh, more than 100 years ago out of the basement of the city library in Menominee with carriages and getting on the train and then going out to all parts of the county. So um, we are on our sixth bookmobile. We've had this one for three years, um, but we have had an actual bookmobile, I believe, since 1948. Um, 
it, the county is about 50 miles or maybe a little bit more north to south. So we, we do have distances to travel. We um, are on two lane state and highway, state and federal highways and mostly county roads also. Our, um, our main service area is, or that we service is really the schools. We have six different school districts in our service area that we serve. One is Native American, one is parochial, and then the others are public schools. Um, so pre-COVID, we would, a lot of our time was spent at the schools, kids picking out books. Um, we would do story times. We would take books of, crates of books to teachers to use in their classroom. We are able to bring the crates of books to teachers currently at most of the schools, not all of them. Um, but we have not had kids on since last March. Um, we uh, follow a monthly schedule to the schools and the community stops. We've added township halls on Saturdays recently. We um, go to the county fair and local parades when those are available. Um, our total staffing for our library, which is a main branch, a satellite branch and the bookmobile is 4.5 um, employees. So we have a lot on our plate. It keeps us hopping to keep the bookmobile going and especially when the schools are in full swing. Um, so we, there's kind of two different seasons of bookmobile, school year and summer. Summer is light duty. And um, so I take time off in the summer, which is a benefit also. Um, I love that it provides us so much flexibility when our satellite branch was closed for many, many months um, due to COVID. We were able to serve those people with the bookmobile. A lot of elderly people don't drive large, long distances in the county. Um, we also have the flexibility to um, add more time to busier stops take time away from less busy stops or, you know, just find new places to go. Um, and I love the stories of people that have been coming to the bookmobile for years or went to it years ago. I have a 93 year old patron who has been coming to the bookmobile for more than 50 years. So I love to see his face each month. That's wonderful, Anne. I'm sure your county really appreciates having this resource. And we're going to drive on over to um, Barbara in Monroe. Good morning. Um, I was speaking with Kathy and Joe before the webinar started, and I asked who was going to be attending because I wanted to speak about things that might be relevant to the audience. And I get that Zoom fatigue is a real thing, so I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you the story of how Monroe County got a children's bookmobile. Um, so... We provided bookmobile services for children in Monroe County uh, from 1949 until 1998. And then we had to stop due to budget constraints. And we recognized though that bookmobiles provide a lot of value. When we spoke about the goals of the bookmobile, it was to support our mission. The library mission is to enrich the quality of life for all residents by providing free access to informational, educational and recreational resources. And the bookmobile does that by removing barriers and equalizing opportunities. And, and that's something that I think um, everyone can get uh, behind. In May of 2018, uh, one of our uh, staff members, families made a bequest in her honor. Uh, she was a, a young library employee who passed tragically. Her family made a $100,000 donation to the Monroe County Library System in Corey's honor. And that was the beginning of our bookmobile. And at the time, I didn't know anything about um, running a bookmobile or a, a campaign. And I thought $100,000, we'd be good to go because I thought that'd be enough. Turns out it's not. So we, um, we involved the entire community in the process of finishing uh, the funding for our bookmobile. Um, so the library staff member's name was Corey Lake. And we decided to name our bookmobile Corey, K-O-R-R-I. And we had a contest to name it. Uh, some everyone was invited to um, suggest things to go with that acronym. Our bookmobile Corey stands for Keep on Reading, Reaching, and Imagining. And you may be able to see that at the bottom of the slide there. Um, we had a reveal to our community. We really wanted grassroots efforts uh, and support from the bottom up. And so we 
and people like to celebrate. So we threw a lot of parties for the bookmobile. We had a reveal early on where we announced our intention to begin fundraising and we showed an artist rendering of the bookmobile and we provided um, tiered donation levels for people. So if you picture a pyramid in your mind, we had grant opportunities at the bottom because those would be the most significant dollars uh, donated. Then we had businesses kind of in the middle layer. Everybody wanted to support the bookmobile. And at the top, we had individuals. So we gave people an opportunity to donate uh, $20 and they would get a certificate that said, um, I've put a book, a book on the bookmobile. People really liked that. Um, it was a nice keepsake or a stocking stuffer around the holidays. And we ended up raising the remaining $100,000 that we needed for the bookmobile in less than 11 months. And more than 100 different individuals and organizations donated. And I think that's significant. I, I think that shows that Monroe uh, was eager to resume these services in our county. Um, we also thanked our sponsors or our donors by offering a variety of um, rewards to them as well. So the largest donors have um, their organizations um, on the outside of the bookmobile, on the back of our bookmobile. The, uh, the three largest donors are um, honored there. The Lazy Boy Foundation, our hospital, Prometica Regional Hospital, and the Community Foundation of Monroe. Inside, there were opportunities. We have a, a plaque inside honoring uh, mid-level donors. We also made t-shirts because they're fun. And my story includes a show and tell. So here is the t-shirt front. And then on the back, we have donors listed. Um, and when we had raised all the funds and our bookmobile was delivered, we threw uh, another party because again, I do think that people want to, um, to celebrate. And um, we had the uh, local TV station, a, a TV station from Toledo here, the radio uh, station was here, and we, we had a physical reveal that was lovely. Uh, we had a bubble machine. We had cookies uh, custom made in the shape of the bookmobile. Um, and it was, I've never done fundraising before, but I will tell you, um, it was very easy to raise funds for the bookmobile. Part of it is nostalgia. Um, part of it is uh, businesses had some, some self-interest, some uh, self-promotion uh, included in that. But mostly we were able to share statistics and demographics with people. The value of literacy and reaching vulnerable populations really resonated with people. And, and we found our community was eager to get books in the hands of children. So we are thrilled to uh, offer this. Our goal was to reach 500 families in the first year. We actually reached more than 5,000 people in the first nine months. So we we're very excited about that. Um, and you can see we launched on National Bookmobile Day, April 2019. Uh, obviously in March of 2020, the whole world changed again. Um, and I'm gonna speak to that on the next session section a little bit about how we've adapted our services to that. If there's any, um, if you have specific questions about how you might be able to get a bookmobile in your community, my contact information is in there and I'd be happy to, to help you provide this valuable service to your residents as well. Barbara, thank you so much for that touching story. You got me choked up there in the beginning. Um, what a great uh, share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mary. All right. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so Rochester Hills, uh, our original bookmobile, we started in 2004, um, but we had to replace that one a few years ago. And so we actually, we couldn't afford a brand new one. So we, we purchased a used one and that's the top that's the top picture. Um, it's not as pretty as some of yours, but it, it chugs along. It, it's done really well for us. Um, we run a weekly stop, so we go to about 24 different locations every week. We always have two people on the bookmobile. There's always a driver and a librarian. Um, and pretty much all of our, most of our, all but one of our salaried librarians will be We'll have a shift on the bookmobile, and then we have some some subs that take shifts as well. Um, 
the top bookmobile is is open for the entire community so anybody can come on to this one and we offer you know, everything from a whole we do story times in the summer at several different of our stops um right now obviously we're not letting anybody on so we have we put tables out so people can still browse some some other materials and we'll grab something off if there's something specific that they're looking for um, and we just um, got approved to get a, a, a cradle point so we can have the the mobile wi-fi um, so that should be starting soon and then the bottom one is Uh, can anybody hear? We've lost your audio, Mary. But this is what we use that one for. It is, um, we go to 22, I think, preschools and daycares only. Um, the public is not allowed on this one. Um, so we take this to the daycares. We run on a bi-weekly schedule with this one. And the librarian will either go into the school or do the story time on the bus, depending on how the school is. And then the, the, each child can check out one book for the classroom. And if teachers want to check out books as well, they can they can check those out. Um, obviously, with COVID, we haven't been able to to do this our early literacy bus yet. But we um, do have plans to go to about seven or eight schools, I think, this summer. So we contacted some of the schools, and they're really excited to have us back. Some some of the kids that we'll be seeing probably don't even know about us because <laughs> they haven't ever seen us. So that'll be that'll be really fun. And I mean, one of the favorite features for the early literacy bus is how excited the kids are to see the, the blue bus. I mean, they get they get super excited when, when we pull up. Um, and I have on here for my favorite feature an appropriate generator. And I say that because with this, uh, with our current bookmobile, we, we really struggled with our generator. And um, we this is we're on our third one. So the original, they didn't even know if it was going to work, but our guys were able to get it to work for a while and then we had to replace it and then that one didn't work um because it wiggled too much and so um so wires would come loose so then we'd lose the connection so we'd lose the generator so right before the pandemic hit they the they found the correct generator for us and it works beautifully and they were able to replace that and um the the roof units so we have the the air and the, we did have heat by propane which was kind of annoying so now we have regular heat regular air from the 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 top units um one of my other favorite features is not actually bookmobile specific it's we are able to park our both vehicles at the rochester hills department of public services garage and so the mechanics handle like 90% of all the maintenance. If there's a big thing that they can't do, they're really awesome about giving us recommendations of where to take it. So they can't generally do some, they can do some um, generator maintenance and things like that, but for bigger generator problems, we have to go to Cummins. And, but they pretty much handle any big thing that needs to be handled. And they, they charge us a minimal fee and we're okay with paying that because it's it's better than keeping them parked outside um especially in the winter with um diesel fuel so thank you thanks mary um it's handy to have those uh maintenance guys <laughs> around that's great uh next up we have mary g from ypsilanti hey and can you guys hear me yes okay <laughs> I, I can take over. I just brought it in on my phone. So, um, yeah, so pre-COVID, this was everything we're doing. It's a little different now, but I'll talk mostly about pre-COVID. Um, we have a little story time seating area on the inside um, that is wonderful. So on our route, we, um, during the daytimes, we are at preschools, kindergartens, and first grade classes, um, where we do story times for half an hour. And then, um, in the evenings we're in neighborhoods. And then during the summertime, we do a similar model, but instead of schools, we're at like summer camps and stuff. Um, one of the things I really love about that is that we've, we, we work really closely with our local school district. And um, we started doing field trips for second and fifth, eighth and 12th grades to our big library buildings. So basically kids in our public school district are coming on the bookmobile 
as preschoolers, kindergartners, and first graders. And then in second grade, they're coming for a field trip to the library. So there's this continuity and they're really putting the pieces together of like everything the library is. Um, so that's been, that's been really great. Um, of course, everything's been thrown off by COVID and we, are, um, we haven't been on the road at all. We are starting next week with curbside only, like on a limited curbside route. Um, one of our concerns is that we don't even wanna put two staff members in there together. So um, it's just gonna be the driver going out and then taking things outside curbside. So, um, and then we do require a C I'm sorry, I'm getting feedback now. We require a CDL because it has air brakes. Um, so that, I think that's the reason that our vehicle requires a CDL because I saw there were some questions about that in chat. I think that's it, thanks. Great, thank you. Well, we're gonna move on to our, our Q&A. Um, so we're gonna highlight some of the um, FAQs um, that we have written out for you. Uh, all the participants today took some time to give you some general answers, but we're gonna go through some of those FAQs real quick. So panelists, we have about 15 minutes. So we're gonna call this the speed dating of bookmobiles, okay? So um, give us some highlights as um, I go through our list um, of frequently asked questions. And then for all of our attendees, please pop in the chat box um, any questions you might have at this time um, uh, that Joe will keep track of and we'll save and we'll, we'll take a minute to do that at the end. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, so that we can kind of have this Q&A face-to-face, so to speak. And we're going to start um, with Regina and Monica. If you would like to highlight um, what additional services your bookmobile offers, um, and like from printing to tablet stations or whatnot, um, Regina, do you want to share any additional services? I got unmute. Am, am I unmuted? Yes, I can, can hear you, you now. Right, great. Okay. Um, well, as I was saying, the, the mobile uh, is quite large. Um, I don't even know the number of books we fit on there, but we have DVDs. Uh, we have um, a TV in, in the back that we... Um, would uh, have sing-alongs and um, show movies and play uh, video game, um, uh, gaming competitions. This is all pre-COVID. Um, we have a print, uh, copy and printing station. We have two sit-down computers and four stand-up uh, computers that uh, people can use. Um, we are able to uh, do library cards and um, have uh, people uh, bring people ho people's holds and place holds and uh, do reference services. Um, we uh, have also a big screen on the outside, and uh, we would play. We would play a lot of music, uh, uh, Motown sounds and sing-alongs and show movies and um, uh, show uh, do story time outside and we could do it inside as well. We just purchased um, this uh, radio system where you could uh, choose a radio station and we could broadcast to your car and um, uh, able to broadcast because we have a able to film, you can see us as well as hear us on the radio station. Uh, we haven't had opportunity to use that yet, um, but I hear our, our reaches all over Detroit. <laughs> That's how, <laughs> but we will never do anything that large, <laughs> but, but we can choose a station and be out there if we wanted to. So that's pretty cool. Um, Pre-COVID, we had um, service to senior centers. We would uh, we would have a van service that we deliver books um, to um, 
senior centers and living facilities. And we would also go every Wednesday to daycare centers and, and um, to deliver a um, depository collection for them for a month, about 50 books and do a story time and a craft. And um, so we haven't been able to do that. Because of COVID, we moved our senior delivery service to our Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped service, where they're now um, mailing um, about three to four books to the people who are interested in having large print books delivered to their home. So, you know, hopefully things get back <laughs> where well, we can do something these wonderful things again. Um, but in the meantime, we make do. Uh, like I was uh, saying earlier, uh, last year, we had a, a, a ball. We were out uh, to farmers markets, to parks, to um, all kinds of low schools and churches and community centers where people were um, in, uh, delivering food and we will be there passing out books, um, bags of books and goodies and uh, people were thrilled to see us and come. Um, so that's pretty much it. Hey, Regina, I want to know when you have your Motown nights back, because that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, 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 what, and what we do, uh, sometimes we're down on the riverfront. So it's really a blast because you got the, the breeze from the water and the beautiful uh, surroundings and playing music and uh, just having the ball. So. All right. Well, you have my email. <laughs> <laughs> Send me a message. Uh, Monica, did you want to chime in with some services? Um, yeah, so we provide pretty much the same types of services that, you know, everybody else has mentioned. But one thing that we do that um, I haven't heard mentioned yet is we have, they have like Friday night stroll the streets here in Boyne City. And so our friends of the library, we actually haul the books with the bookmobile to the event. And then the friends of the library have like a little mini used book sale under the awning. And so they really, really, um, they love that. So and anytime you can make your friends happy, you know, so. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Mary and uh, from Rochester and Anne, are there some specific audiences you yes. target? Um, the, one of the main purposes is to reach underserved or, or people that maybe can't get to the library as easily due to distance or transportation. So, we do try to focus on getting out to some of those communities. So um, we have several senior living facilities that we go to. Um, we have two mobile home communities that we visit um, and then several apartment complexes. So, and we do require a minimum of two miles away from the library. So if, you know, you're 1.8 miles, we might go. <laughs> but we really try to reach, uh, have that minimum of two, two miles. I guess we focus on um, serving young kids at schools, um, Head Start, daycares, there's not too many daycares in our area, but we do try to serve those with a rotating collection of books and engaging them in our thousand books before kindergarten program. And because there is a high percentage of elderly population in our county, especially in the outlying areas, um, they are probably our main people that come to our community stops. So kind of the, the youngest and the oldest, but of course, everyone's welcome. Thank you, Anne. One of the questions we hear a lot of is how do you determine these bookmobile service sites? Um, you know, what do you use to 
to make those decisions. So um, Mary G and Trevor, do you wanna chime in on how you determine that? Sure, I'll go first. Um, <clears throat> we, I mean, pre-COVID, a lot of our steps are schools. So schools, you know, in Lenoway County, if they're interested, um, you know, we'll pretty much work them into the schedule. Retirement uh, type places too. Obviously with COVID restrictions right now, neither of those are really happening. So as we've just tried to get rolling back onto the road, um, basically we just called daycare centers or, you know, places like that in the county and just said, hey, are you interested in the bookmobile coming back? You know, are you ready for that? And I think everyone was, I don't think anyone said, no, we don't want you. So, um, you know, scheduling can be tricky. You wanna keep your staffs regular. So at this point, you know, we really only have enough. We, normally we do a, a three week rotation before COVID. Now we're down to a two week rotation because we have less stops. Um, you know, and, and you want it to be regular for them so they know, okay, at this day, at this time, the bookmobile's coming, we'll return our old books, get new books, get a story time, um, and stuff like that. So uh, at this point, you know, it's basically based on interest and who wants us to come. And we were happy to see that most places did still want us to come. Nobody's saying no. <laughs> nope, nobody is saying no. Great. Mary G from Ipsy. Yeah, so for our uh, school routes, we prioritize our public school system. Um, we give them, you know, like with our story time route, um, monthly slots, whereas with like charter schools or private schools, um, we tend to offer them kind of like one time special visits. We would do more if we could, but we don't have the staffing capacity to do, to do more than that. So that's kind of how we how we've prioritized. And then with our neighborhood routes, um, we, we try to kind of even out disparities in terms of under um, resourced communities. So ones that lack great public transportation, ones that have you know, been financially disenfranchised, we try to spend more time in those areas, but we also, um, we do sites that are at least a mile outside of, a, of the radius of each of our buildings. Um, we have three branches. So we, you know, they're kind of spread throughout our district. Um, we look at community member requests, uh, we look for you know, like the logistics, like, can we park there? Um, is there, we have an extension, so we have to allow for that too. Like cars have to be able to get around us safely. Um, and then like three times a year, we look at the usage of our current stops and evaluate um, to see if, if they're not getting enough use, then we go somewhere else. So that's what we do. Great, thank you, Mary. Thanks, Trevor. Um, we have a couple more frequently asked questions to address and then we have Joe's compiling uh, a number of questions in the chat so we know we're going to run a few minutes long um, we know if people have to go uh, that's okay we are recording and you can come back later and we're going to keep live notes of the uh, live Q&A in our shared files as well so next up we're going to talk a little bit more um, in depth about programming um, and what types of programs you run from your bookmobile. So we have uh, Kirsten and Trish uh, up first. Hi. Yeah, we have um, crafts for kids, especially in the summer. We do the summer reading program and winter reading program for all ages. And one of the more fun things that we do is we participate in parades. There is a big St. Patrick's Day parade, and so we'll decorate it and pass out candy. And then we even have a book bike, and they'll kind of ride along next to it. And then in the winter, there is a like light parade or a Christmas parade in another town. So that is another fun way to get out there and get recognized. Uh, so we have more passive, not as many of the story times and things like that as other branches are able to do. But um, we do offer some programming, which is nice. I don't know if Trish has anything she wants to, to add. I see the okay sign there. So, uh, uh, Joanne. I'm here. Just have to take a minute to unmute. So uh, pre-COVID, we were involved in a lot of uh, classroom visits for preschools and school age readers, um, kindergarten, first, second grade, and some um, middle school um, classroom type visits, especially if 
Um, we had partners where the libraries were under construction or being um, changed over to being more media centers, and they still wanted kids to really focus on uh, developing their reading skills and some of their critical thinking. And so we were uh, visiting for that purpose and a senior facility and senior um, community visits and gosh, uh, festivals community events, uh, pretty much whenever community said, hey, I want the bookmobile to visit, we were like, okay. And so we were spread a little bit thin, um, kind of over capacity for some of that our very first year, but it was hard to say no, uh, because we just were so thrilled to be able to meet people and, and go do community um, interactions and just have that engagement. Um, during the shutdowns of um, the COVID pandemic, we really um, focused on trying to make phone calls and do emails with our partners and support through hotspot initiatives. And um, Kevin Camerad developed the WIMI show. And um, I'll put that in the chat so people can uh, take a look at it when they have a moment. Um, that's been a weekly, uh, a daily show Monday through Friday um, at a couple of different times, but I think we've settled on four o'clock being the best um, for everybody. And uh, we just engage our patrons um, through that show as well. And um, now we've partnered once we were able to really um, kind of come back and our library branches opened at least for curbside service. We would go to senior centers uh, to be able to drop off their hold requests and help with any tech issues they might be having. Just um, they have their tech device and we have ours and we're like six feet away outdoors. <laughs> and then um, during the summer, we partnered with Feeding America for Meet Up, Eat Up, the school uh, age um, summer food program, and we'll be doing that again this year. It really helps that it's a grab and go option so that we don't have to provide tables and chairs for the kids to sit at and eat in front of us. So we'll do that again um, this year. And um, we've been doing some virtual visits with preschools, doing story times and, and getting the wiggles out, doing finger plays and large motor um, activities and uh, make and takes and um, activities for families. We are partnering with mobile food pantry distribution sites um, monthly, and we bring um, little free library type materials for adults and kids. And we just, they do a drive through to pick up their food material, food items, and we're dropping off books for them to keep or trade out at their little free library locations that are throughout their neighborhoods. And um, it's great to see their smiles and say, we're still here for you and answer questions about the library system. And um, some of those things will remain a part of our services that we offer after. We don't have to be as careful about some of the pandemic things. And um, at the same time, I think some of those changes might be permanent and we just continue to find uh, you know, pivot seems to be the word and unprecedented is another word. So I try to find other words to describe the same activities. And we're just thinking outside of the box, outside of the bus, outside of the bookmobile, any way that we can imagine um, connecting with our patrons wherever they are. And usually if food is involved, people will be there too. So we want to be present and just help support them in any way possible. Information, ideas, and excitement and sparking joy. Um, don't we need a little joy? <laughs> right we now? do. We so do. <laughs> yeah, that's where we're at. Thank you so much. And Barbara, did you wanna add anything? Uh, just very quickly, I will say that we chose our bookmobile vehicle based on the kinds of programming and services we wanted to provide. Uh, for us, uh, that was the, the order of our process of thinking. So our vehicle is only 24 feet long, does not require a CDL, um, and the outside design echoes our library card uh, emblem. So it's important that we're highly visible and easily recognized in our community. Pre-COVID, 
We had people get on the bookmobile and browse the collection and we would provide story times either inside or outside. We have an awning, which I would highly recommend if you're looking at purchasing a bookmobile. That's delightful. We also have a Tommy gate so that uh, people in wheelchairs were able to access. That was very important to us to be able to serve everyone in our community. Um, since COVID, we've uh, adjusted our model and we, we were closed. There were a couple of months where we, the state mandated that, that we not provide services, but we got back on the road very quickly because we tried to think outside of the box. So instead of getting people on the bookmobile, which you cannot do if you're only 24 feet long, we designed a model we call open air book fairs. Our sprinter has shelves that are attached to the sides of the vehicle, but they're also carts. So they are detachable. You can uh, take them down the timing gate, set them outside six feet apart so people can still browse the collection. We were still able to place holds and let people pick up items uh, curbside their local library branch. Um, we have, um, we've also adopted a, or created a, a new model where we're distributing donated books. So mostly our bookmobile circulates library books. Separate from that, we've been doing some book box donations to um, housing uh, projects, apartments, and mobile home communities. And we go every month and we deliver them between 30 and 50 books that have been donated by community partners. They're, it's kind of like a take, read, and return model, except we don't need to have them returned. And in the, we've been doing that, this is our third month, we've distributed more than a thousand books that way. So we are trying to adapt to the post-COVID situation we find ourselves in and still figure out new and creative ways to, to get those books out into the community. The other thing I would like to say is one of our, we have two part-time staff members. One has a real specialty in youth services. One has a strong collection uh, circulation background. And I think that's uh, important to think about as you're considering this. And um, one of them is bilingual. So we're looking to expand those uh, services as the, as the weather improves as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so now we're gonna move on real quick to some funding sources, associated costs, um, all of that with Kristen and Scott. And Scott, you left us on a cliffhanger during your slide. So I'm going to have you start. <laughs> sure. Well, um, a lot of it um, relates to what, what a lot of other individuals have said on here. Um, for our um, bookmobile, we funded it out of our general fund uh, when we purchased it in, in 2016. And there were some questions. I saw Karen and Anne ask some questions about ongoing costs. There are definitely ongoing costs, especially when you look at what type of vehicle you have. Uh, for us, um, we have it under vehicle maintenance. So along with the mobile library, we have delivery vehicles. And in the budget for that, we have just under $20,000 a year. Um, way more than half of that goes to the mobile library. Um, there have just been, uh, because the larger vehicle you purchase, the, um, the more issues you're gonna have, because these aren't mass produced vehicles. And so for us, we went with a very large vehicle. Um, we've had a number of issues. So. Um, when, when we had the COVID shutdown, a animal decided to live in our mobile library, chewed through some wiring, um, there's a cost for that. Uh, I saw in the chat generator discussion, generator costs are real. Ours is going out and it's $20,000 to replace. And our timing belt went out. We had a whole bunch of other maintenance things. And so we are actually at a crossroads uh, because our mobile library has been running um, since we've been back um, from the pandemic and the circulation has never been higher from it, um, but it works in an ice cream truck model. So we have holds, um, just as, as Barbara talked about, we pull carts out and people can kind of shop the collection, but primarily they want it to um, check out items. And so what we're looking at is, is um, just the ongoing cost for our current one uh, is too much. Um, and as other people mentioned, um, there's, a, there's the decision for um, CDL license and there's a cost for that. There's training for that. There's staff willingness for that. And our current vehicle requires it. So what we're gonna actually do is, is get rid of our, our larger vehicle and go with two smaller uh, transit vans. Um, 
they, they're a little more nimble for us, um, more staff can drive them, um, but it also fits how people use them. When we first purchased the, the mobile library, um, we tried to have it be that, that 14th branch. It's really not. What people want to use it for is mainly in an ice cream truck model to, to either pick up their holds or to get items. And so if we wanna do any type of outreach, we can do something else that way. But for cost, you just have to, there is, there's going to be a cost for, especially if you get those larger, more specialized vehicles, you don't know what's gonna go wrong with them. And so when you go with a smaller transit van, just because those are more mass produced, you're not gonna have as many maintenance issues, but you will have maintenance issues with those. And so you have to have, along with your upfront cost, you're gonna to have to budget for ongoing maintenance costs with those as well. And again, um, those are gonna be a lot easier to estimate if you go with a, with a more mass produced vehicle like some of the transit vans that are out there. Thank you, Scott. And Kristen, you're, you're the newbie on the road here. Um, maybe you can address a little bit more about what it's like to um, implement and purchase today. Yeah. So this was about a five-year project or a little bit longer because we used um, completely fundraised and donated money to purchase our van. And um, annually, we have something called Books, Bites, and Bids, which is our annual fundraiser. And for several years, that money was targeted to buying or purchasing um, the uh, library on the go. And we did a puzzle of the... Um, library on the go, kind of a mock-up of it, and people could pur purchase puzzle pieces that were, you know, wheels or books for the library on the go or, you know, parts of the, of the, of the van. And that was a great success. People loved doing that because they could kind of choose, you know, set of windshield wipers for 50 bucks or something like that. And they felt like they were really contributing to the actual van. And um, so, and we also had um, a very generous donation from the Ari Olds Foundation. Um, and so their logo is on the back of our van. And um, so about five years in, six years in, we were able to have the money to purchase a van. And we purchased a Ford Transit simply because we are a city library. We knew we didn't want a big bus. We knew we couldn't afford a big bus. And to be perfectly honest, we are a small library in a smallish area. And we were kind of doing this, and I hate to say this on the cheap. So, um, but we knew we wanted to extend our services out into the community. And um, so we worked with our city um, Department of Public Works who buys the fleet for the city of East Lansing. And they um, helped us buy the van through Signature Ford out of Owasso because that's who they buy their fleet from. So it had to be a Ford. I mean, we were looking at Sprinters, but because the city doesn't buy Sprinters, we went with Ford. And so we lost a little bit of space, um, but it is super easy to drive. So I've been told I've not driven it yet. Um, I can barely drive my Honda Accord. So we'll see how that works out. Um, but people have said it's very easy. It has a, a short nose, so it's easy to see out in front of and um, has a great rear um, camera. But, um, and then the maintenance will be done via our Department of Public Works for the most part. Um, first year, we hope to get, you know, fairly maintenance free, but to have stuff under warranty as well. Um, I'm looking at the chat and all the things that you have to think about and listen to Scott's stories and I'm kind of in denial that we're going to have any huge maintenance issues. Um, so, you know, may just leave that van somewhere on the road <laughs> if that comes to that. But um, we are using our staff as is right now. As I said earlier, we're using our programming staff to go out and do the programs or to circulate the books and do various things. Bryce Bush and I, um, she's our assistant director, are going to be in, at the downtown East Lansing market days and we're going to um, sell friends materials with the friends from, um, from, from the Mobile. We plan to go to the farmer's market and do several things. Um, that many of you have already said, but when it comes to costs, I mean, yeah, we, we added costs for the Wi-Fi, we added costs for oil changes, for general maintenance, and um, we will do 
like I said, most of that through our Department of Public Works. However, they are going to charge us the full price for that. So, and, and rightfully so, and they will do most of that maintenance. Um, the total cost for us, so we purchased the, the, the vehicle, which was um, probably close to $40,000 because we had to get double wheels and, you know, it has to have weight bearing things. And we have an extended roof so that you can stand up straight in it. So that was probably close to $40,000. And then the uplifting was another $77,000. Roughly, um, and that was done through Farber Specialty Vehicles in Columbus, Ohio. So there's only a few places truly in the country, like Colorado, North Carolina, and Columbus, that do real uplifting for library or for vehicles like that. Um, Farber's is huge, and it's an ama amazing place. And they were very much wanted us to come and see the entire process and to see what they do. Um, at their facilities. So fortunately, we were able to do that pre-COVID. Our um, project got pushed back because of COVID. So Ford Transits, they weren't able to get parts for some of them, you know, to, to roll them off the assembly line. So that, that pushed us back a bit. Um, but um, but I, I actually really like the, the, the smaller, more nimble, van that does not require a CDL. When I worked at Columbus Metropolitan Library, I did go out. I was um, called a rover at that time and went out on the bookmobile. They were huge, but you had to have a CDL licensed driver. And that's what those, those people, those staff did. They just drove the bookmobile. And of course they helped, um, but uh, it's nice. And Columbus has since gone to the smaller vans as well to be more nimble. And you can just get in and out of places much easier. So hopefully starting in May, we'll be at our parks um, every Monday and then the senior centers and then the various festivals that happen throughout um, East Lansing. Thank you, Kristen. Kathy, yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, Kristen brings up a, a very good point because when you're researching having one of these, whether it's you have a, a department that can take over the maintenance costs or a good mechanic, because there's some mechanics that won't even want to touch these vehicles. And so that's, again, something to, to keep in mind when you're evaluating it is, do you have a, a mechanic that you can work with when it breaks down? Because as you can see in the chat, there's a lot of sad stories when it breaks down on the road and, and you have to get the tow truck. First, you have to find the tow truck who's going to be willing to tow it. And then you have to find the mechanic who's willing to work on it as well. And I will just add that I think, like, if you buy a Ford, the Ford dealer is going to tell you, we'll service it, you know, like when you buy any car. But Kind of in this case, I'm like, I'm all for that, you know. <laughs> I um, I have quite the story about the old days on the Flint Public Library bookmobile, but that'll have to be another call. <laughs> um, so uh, we're shifting. Joe's going to handle some live Q&A if we have any. Uh, we understand some of our panelists might have other commitments. We didn't realize we should have made this a 90-minute webinar because there's so much passion <laughs> and love for bookmobiles here. So if you have a question, pop it in the chat. Joe's got some that he's pulled. So we've got a, a small handful um, and a lot of these parts of the questions in the chat have been addressed, but um, th there are some areas I think um, that could use a little bit more information. So uh, one of the first questions was, how do you manage the stops um, in terms of, are you, parking the bookmobile for an hour, two hours? Um, is it a weekly stop schedule? Is it a monthly schedule where you're hitting the same places over and over again? Would uh, any of the panelists like to speak to that? I would be happy to speak to that as I'm one of the panelists yeah. on another commitment at 1130. So I'll, answer, I'll take the first question and then I'm gonna have to um, step out. Appreciate so it. our bookmobile operates, um, some of our stops are one time only. If you're a festival or a special event, you're only getting the one stop. Our recurring visits are monthly. That's a schedule that seems to work really well for us. Um, it also times well with the length of time that our books circulate. So no one's books are going to be overdue until we come back for our return um, for our return visit. Okay. All right. Um, next question would be: What's the startup budget? versus the maintenance budget. So that's that's pretty detailed. And Scott talked about that. So did um, Kristen. Um, 
if if you want more information on that, um, if anybody wants to speak to it, please feel free, panelists. Um, other than that, I would direct folks watching to the FAQ where we the, the panelists graciously gave us their email addresses so you could contact them. Also look at the FAQ for their detailed responses. Um, they, they answered a lot of the questions where we had just a couple of people answering through the webinar. Um, every participant, every panelist answered all of those questions. So please feel free to take a look at that. Does anyone want to talk about startup budget versus your maintenance budget? Or uh, you wish you, you knew now what you uh, should have known then before you started the bookmobile? I can chime in real quick, Joe, um, because when I started this project, and I had started some research on um, library vans or library trucks that didn't require CDLs. Um, I was told, oh yeah, about thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 to buy one or start it up, get it all the way you want it and everything. Um, yeah, not so much. <laughs> it's more of 100000 or more to get the things that you really want to have on it um, so that you have Wi-Fi, so that you have, you know, cabinets and you have the carts that lock in place and the track on the floor and um, you know that you have the dual wheels and the extended roof all of that um, adds up so like I said I think our cost um, for purchasing and uplifting was right around $125,000 and then going forward so this first year I budgeted about $6,000 for maintenance outside of regular maintenance just to be very safe. Um, I think hope, hopefully most of the, like I said, ma most of the maintenance should be covered by warranty, but I wanted to have that cushion just to be safe. Okay. Um, we had another, uh, I'm sorry, Mary, did you want to add something? Um, well, I saw that so we, the collection thing popped up too. So I just wanted to mention that, um, First of all, I, I'm not going to talk about the, the startup because I wasn't there when we started up ours and um, we'll eventually get to a new one. But um, our maintenance, we have $20,000 budgeted for maintenance and that's for both vehicles. Um, honestly, until a couple of years ago, we didn't actually even meet that for, for two vehicles. So I, you know, I think it really depends. Um, but then the last couple of years, we've actually surpassed that. So. And then for, as far as the collections, we um, we have a whole outreach is a whole own department and our outreach budget includes the large print materials and then the, all the materials for both of wheels. So, um, which is, I mean, it's a significant, it's a significant amount for, for everything that we have to purchase. Um, we have our own collections on the bookmobiles. We have bookmobile storage. So for more seasonal things and, and bestsellers that have fallen off a little, but then we keep them for a little while in case people start requesting them again for every reason. So, um, and I think our, our materials budget for the entire department, with the large print, we have many branches and two bookmobiles, is just under a hundred thousand. So. Yeah, there was uh, there was also this um, great comment. Uh, I'll read it out. Um, this presentation has sparked some great ideas. I'm from Michigan originally, got my MLS from Wayne State, but I live in Florida now and we just acquired a golf cart for our library on the go. Smaller than all of you, but still impactful for a beach town community. We'll have a cart that tows behind for carrying books. Any ideas for smaller scale service? Something along the go golf cart model. Has anyone tried that? There's lots of bikes on the go. That's true. Tyler. We have, uh, yeah, we have a book. We have a bike. It was purchased by book. our friends a few years ago, and it goes to the smaller areas that the bookmobile can't reach. So a number of different festivals nearby. Um, it's small enough to put in one of our vans, so we can actually take it further than somebody can actually ride it. 
Um, we give out books, we give out pamphlets, we have um, tablets, et cetera, where we can show people how to use our databases, sign them up for our library cards. Um, it's, doesn't, it's not as full service, obviously, as the bookmobile is, but we try and put as many services to it as possible. And that's been a nice alternative for taking the bookmobile. Okay. Um, so last question that I've got. Um, CDLs were mentioned quite a few times today. And it sounds like a lot of the folks that may have had a large enough field or vehicle to require the CDL tend to be moving to smaller services. For the folks that still have um, the, the equipment that would require the CDL, can you talk a little bit about the expense, the training time um, for acquiring one for your staff? Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so, because we went, we're on our fourth bookmobile now. Um, we replaced about in 2008 was when we put this new one on the road that did require CDL. Before that, we just needed a chauffeur's license with our last one. Um, and so what we have found works, I mean, we tried to hire CDL drivers, but they're in high demand. And so finding somebody, and we expect our drivers also to do customer service. So what we have found works the best is to hire the right person who is interested in getting a CDL pay for the training and ask them to stay at least a year. And that that's worked out pretty well. Um, but when we did have somebody leave, like two weeks notice is nothing for that cycle. So we really had to, we had to, had to like modify our schedule in between drivers. That was really rough. Um, so that's just a challenge, but um, the expense, I mean, I think that uh, we sent the drivers to like a CDL school in the Metro Detroit area. I think it was, um, a couple thousand dollars and then you know there's the testing fee which is like maybe a hundred i don't remember exactly but i could look it up if, if anybody wants like exact information but the real thing is the staff time because he had to spend i think two weeks going to that academy and then all the testing and stuff so it's like a lot of staff time costs too um but I, I i would still do it this way given all the difficulty because like i said in the chat earlier like i drove the old one i never felt like I had to take like a 10 question written test to get a chauffeur's license. And that felt like definitely not enough to be driving something the size of a school bus around town. Um, I like knowing that the people driving the bus have gone through a really rigorous training program. Um, so it is a total headache and it's one that's worth it to me to run something that big. But like the appeal that the direction of going to smaller vehicles has appealed to. <laughs> But with something this big, I want them to have a CDL. And that, that's pretty much the last question we had. Um, I see that someone asked about where, they're, where folks are storing their, their bookmobiles and it looks like that's starting to be answered in the chat. I can also add that to the FAQ if our, our panelists would um, be inclined to fill that out. How, how do you store your bookmobile? I'll just add that to the FAQ that's available to everyone. I um, want to thank the panelists for being with us here today and all of you for, for learning and, and receiving this knowledge. Um, it, it's been great. You can tell there's a lot of passion for bookmobiles. Um, Kathy, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, just a big thank you for everybody's time today. And um, this panel has been amazing. They just popped the slides in, popped in their answers to the frequently asked questions. They're all very passionate about bookmobile services. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to them. And we're looking forward to seeing everybody on the road. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, everyone.